Good afternoon, everybody. Um, nice to see everybody. This is, glad it's a new group because this is a slight sort of hospital pass that's been sort of handed out here. Um, firstly, who am I? My name is Tom Oates. Um, I act as a land agent. Um, now, a lot of you will say, what is a land agent? It's not a bad question. It means an awful lot of things. Essentially, rural business advisor, advising all sorts of things. I'm an approved agent for the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association. I am an agent for AMC. Um, as some of you may note there, my, the address for the office there is actually Northumberland. Um, as one or two of you guys in here with familiar faces will know, my uh, area of work is the length and breadth of Scotland. I mean that seriously. I've got clients in Isla, on Bute, a lot in Dumfries and Galloway, Grantham on Spey, um, all over the place, Perthshire, Angus, um, a lot of things. A lot of it is mainly tenanted uh, work. Now, I'm going to cheat today. Um, as is the first one, we'll allow it to cheat. Um, we were asked to do five. I'm actually going to do three things. <laughs> <laughs> However, I do caveat it there that the first one there has actual multiple arms and legs. So the first one could actually be five in itself. But I thought they actually linked through to, to go through there. The other are land reform, land values and cash flows. Now these are practical things that I perceive are facing the industry north of the border at this moment in time. And they are, to be honest, fairly major. First one, land reform, due in May next year. Multiple things included in this one there. One of the primary ones which has caused a lot of discussion recently, and there's one or two guys in here have been involved in this there, is the good old rent review. Those of you who are aware, we had the issues with rent reviews using the uh, comparable evidence, and the issues arise up the case for Moonsey, up at Cooper, and then compounded by the case of Rocks Remains, which was eventually uh, went through in 2014. The old system for reviewing farm rents, and I apologise actually, I'm sort of going over old ground for a lot of you, um, but the old system for farm rents was using comparable information and saying this farm is comparable to that farm and this one's paying that, therefore you should pay that. The difficulty was in the adjusting factors between the farm rents. And this was the crucial thing that the court was not realistically able to do. Um, so there was a major, major push, push after Roxburgh in results to move away from comparable evidence to using um, a... Uh, a productive method capacity, calculating what it should be, taking a farm, stripping out any improvements that the tenants had done. You can only be rented on what you've actually been provided with by your landlord. Working out a hypothetical system for that farm and working out the figures to come to a divisible surplus which was to be split between landlord and tenant. It sounds simple but it has caused a huge amount of consternation within, within the industry. Um, now, this is where a lot of um, figures are needed, and this is one of the things I'm driving through the whole list of there, is we need figures, we need data, we need accurate data, past data, present data, um, and future data as well. Working out a rent on a budget-based system is highly, highly volatile. If you adjust the price by £10 a tonne, you can produce a rental difference of about five or eight grand. We've worked through this in practice, and just that small adjustment has a huge, huge effect. Um, so this is the kind of data that we're looking at there. We're looking at fixed cost analysis. We're using booklets at the SAC Farm Management. But this data needs to be very, very accurate for us there. And it needs to be continuously evolving as well. Access to things all the time, because too much is his, far too historic. And you think of a grain price jump, Chicago jumped was it five quid last Monday, but it went back down on Tuesday. You know, that kind of thing there has a massive, massive there. One of the things that's been suggested as well, it's up for discussion, is a way of having a rental database, storing farm rents. Personally, I'm not in favor of that, because <coughs> behind every rental agreement, there is a story. Staying with land reform, um, what we have really is the potential for dispute. Huge amount of it in land reform. What we're going to come through as part of the bill is uh, an amnesty on tenants' improvements, where there's a retrospective period to reg register um, what tenants have done to the farms. Um, the aim of this is that if it is an improvement, the landlord is obliged to compensate at the end of the tenancy. So therefore, it's a way for which tenants can get a retirement package. 
There's a change in the succession. Succession planning as to who the farm can be handed on to. At the moment, it's straight down the line, direct family. The intention is to widen out the groups, so you're essentially bringing in cousins, so the more farm tenancies can be passed on, so more land can potentially remain within the tenant sector. Another thing that the land reform is dealing with is assignation. Now this one is particularly um, contentious. This is dealing with things like, trying to deal with the, the issues of the absolute right to buy. And so the proposal as part of the land reform is that, and it's a proposal at the moment, is that secure tenancies can be assigned on to another party for a 35 year term. So they remain in the tenant sector, but they only go for 35 years. That one is still up for debate. Now they can be assigned for value. So again, there's a way that a tenant could retire. So there's an issue about the valuation process that we're having to consider is how much would that tenancy be worth? Quick example could be that a 500 acre farm, it's let under a secure tenancy for 50 pounds an acre. That's 25 grand a year rent. One under an LDT would probably be about 80 pounds an acre. That's 40 grand. So therefore, that's a rental difference of 15K over 35 years. It's 525,000. How much of that would a potential tenant be prepared to offer up front to jump into the tenant's shoes? Interesting sort of there, angle there, but you may well see these in the Scottish farmer in years to come, tenancies to be assigned. One final thing that is, is a part of the land reform there is dealing with how tenants come out of the sector, the Wago valuation. Um, a lot of these things have been done over many, many different years, um, and, and also it's a valuation process which is crucial. How the methodology is that the, the method of valuation is the value to an incoming tenant. But crucially, none of these have ever been through the land court yet. So there's still a bit of discussion within the industry about how much that silage pitch is actually worth. The old write-down method has gone. But how much is that silage pit worth? Or the sh and it actually goes far. How do you value a field that's been drained? Um, a land restoration. The concrete on the ground, what's the life expectancy left in that? So... With this land reform um, coming through, there's a lot of uncertainty within the, uh, the tenant sector and there's a lot of potential for dispute between landlord and tenant. As a result, a number of tenants have been offered the opportunity to buy their land. Now this is interesting at this moment in time because we move on to what's this land actually worth? It has gone up seriously in the past, what, half a dozen, eight years. Land values have really, really escalated. I think it's important to look at why um, it's been driven by a number of people. It's been driven by investors looking at a secure place to put their money. The stock market's been very sort of on the, on the bottom there. So land is seen as a very secure asset to invest in. Um, they've been enjoying the rise in the capital value. There's the big thing, inheritance tax. Shunt your money into land and be a farmer. It's a way that you can actually hand it on to the next generation tax-free. It's a major, major driver. Interestingly, in recent years, what we found in the industry, that a lot of the trade in land has actually been farmer-driven. They've had some good years. Um, you know, corn's been a good trade. Um, and, you know, it's been farmer-driven. The, the chance to expand, they've enjoyed the low interest rates. They've enjoyed the ability to borrow money over a long term at low cost. I fixed in some borrowing for a fella about a year ago, 18 months ago, a 30-year fixed rate at under 3%. Now, if that doesn't work, nothing will. Um, but see, crucially, though, where are we now? We've got the political situation. There's a political uncertainty. I've got a number of clients at the moment, about half a dozen of them, who have serious cash. And every one of them has said to me, I don't want to see anything in Scotland. It's too uncertain. They're not looking to invest. You've got... You've got... Um, there's no cash in the farms. The farmers have had... This is probably the third bad year in a row. It's been a bumper, bumper harvest, don't get me wrong, but it's worth nothing. And the truth be known is they can't shift it. You know, the forward price at the moment for January is £115 a tonne for wheat. I rang up some the other day to say, could you take some? He says, no, don't want it. 
if you force me, I might give you 95 quid. But they are absolutely full. There's no cash for the farmers to buy it there. Um, also, we've got the additional land coming around, the stuff about the tenant and sector. So we're in a classic case of oversupply of land and no money to afford to buy, the lack of investors coming in. Now, the Scottish farmer in June, before the Highland Show, is generally the time when most full of farms are advertised. I think there was 35 farms in there this year. The truth be known is, most of those were in there last year as well, which is a worrying statistic. Now, in order to buy your farm, it all needs to be affordable. Turnovers, vanity, profit, sanity, but cash is king. Now, this is a massive for here and now. As I said before, farm accounts 2015, good harvest, low price, high costs. The third year of bad accounts. Bankers are not farmers. They sit in the ivory tower and they look at a set of accounts. And there's an awful lot of explaining goes into farm accounts. Often you'll see farmers put in intensive care because their accounts are bad. Farmers are often guilty for their accounts looking bad because they don't like paying tax. So they'll go and buy a shiny tractor every year to avoid paying tax. When they're back to the wall and they go to the bank and say, I have some money, he says, your accounts are bad. The fact that he's bought a shiny tractor in the year is no defence. They need to actually start thinking more business. Paying tax isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, with the accounts at the moment, as I say, the cash is an issue. You couple that with the massive, massive uncertainty of basic payment scheme. This is the here and now. What's it worth? Bear in mind we're now November. Most guys were used to getting paid on the 1st of December. And when's it going to come? If you take the lesson from England in 2005 when their system came in, and bear in mind most of the Scottish guys expect to get theirs on the 1st of December, most of the English guys didn't get paid until May the following year, and then a lot of them didn't receive it all. Huge, huge issues. And I think the industry needs to be fully... They've jumped on the bandwagon now, but there's something there which was banging the drum for quite a while. Likewise with SRDP schemes. You know, where's, where's, where's that coming from? So, ultimately, looking at the here and now, the practical implications, where are we? Have we got the perfect storm? We've got the uncertainty, we've got the pressure from land reform, we've got the lack of confidence in industry valuing there, we've got potential devaluation of land, we've got potential for interest rates to rise, so, and the ability to borrow is getting less and less. So what we do need in order to provide some reassurance going forward is sound data that we can rely on which is currently moving. Sound data will allow people to hang their hats on things and actually present something to allow future investment going forward. Thank you.